Welcome back to Power Performances. Brought to you by Courtyard by Marriott. I and Eagle, along with Jason Horowitz, college football, the topic of conversation, things really heating up around the country, and we're honored to be joined by a man you see every Saturday in the College Football Today studio on CBS, along with our man Timmy B. He is Spencer Tillman joining us now on the Power Performances. Spencer, great to have you on the program. Thanks so much for joining us. How you doing? Thanks for having me, guys. You guys are talking about some great stuff, man. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to be with you this morning. Well, let's get right to it. And the Oregon State victory over USC, Spencer, what kind of uh, large, broad effect did that have on the race in the BCS in your eyes? Well, it's huge. I mean, I think uh, we were all jumping all over Charlie Weiss for being a little bit uh, aggressive prior to their matchup with uh, the Middies last week. But I think in hindsight, he may have known something that we all perhaps were a little bit short-sighted on, and that is the shakeup. No one anticipated USC falling. Certainly, uh, Cal perhaps was the team that everyone thought would have knocked them off, but uh, it didn't happen that way. And then, of course, we were waiting for the big showdown on November 18th. But look, if this totally throws a wrench into everything, guys. You've got a host of one lost teams that have a legitimate beat that they should be in the mix as well. But then you've got Rutgers that's sitting out there undefeated right now. We know it's going to shake out over the next couple of weeks, but it does throw a major wrench in the landscape of college football. Spencer, you're talking about one loss teams. There are two undefeated teams going at it tomorrow. One of them will leave with a loss. Talk to us about uh, West Virginia and Louisville coming up tomorrow. Your thoughts on the winner as far as propelling itself because right now West Virginia and Louisville both three and five in the BCS undefeated are pretty far back of Michigan and Ohio State whoever wins that game how much do they close that gap between those two teams I think they close it guys but I don't think they close it a lot and and again you you hit it right on the head I think the big three prior to USC falling were so far ahead of everybody else that in the minds of most people particularly on the this side, they would have to do astronomical efforts on the football field to close that gap. I still think whoever emerges from this game victorious is still going to have some wood to chop. I think maybe West Virginia among the two probably has a little bit more street cred because of the way they came into this year having right. dominated Georgia in the bowl game. So that may be an advantage for them, but I think Louisville has done an excellent job recovering from injuries, you know, mm. key mission yes, critical they. positions. But, you know, it's going to be interesting to see. I still think for both of these teams, they still got some credibility to establish. All right, Spencer, we're going to go to the phones. Remember, 646-CBS-1000. If you're watching right now live here on CBS Sportsline, get in and talk to Spencer Tillman or INRI or even Mike Riley in just a little bit. Spencer, Christian from New York, he's got a question for you about the BCS. Christian, go ahead. Hey, guys, how are you? Good, Good how Christian. are you? Long-time listener, first-time caller. Very nice. You got that out. <laughs> um, I'm not really a big fantasy football fan. Um, I actually was hoping to talk about the BCS. Please, yeah, go ahead. Go for it. Um, first of all, I loved your segment with Greg Shiano last week. That was awesome. Thank you very much. Um, first off, I just wanted to ask the question, do you think Boise State has a chance to win the national championship this year? Mm. Spencer, <laughs> Spencer, you want to leave that to you? We'll, we'll leave it to you. No. Boise State, where do they fit in? We can bounce in there, guys. I will say this. What's really intriguing, the guy that's the happiest man on the planet will be Tim Brando because it's the last flying <laughs> one that's out there. These other teams are going to face each other. You know what's going to happen with Michigan and Ohio State. Somebody will lose that one. And then you've got the other two uh, biggies in the, in the uh, SEC, the one-loss teams. They're going to wind up being a two-loss team among those. And so you've got Boise State sitting out there. And everybody's going to be wondering how can this undefeated team that's a have-not, they're going to get the sentimental vote. Uh, but they don't have a legitimate chance of winning a national champion. Let's face it, guys, it's not going to happen uh, as long as we have a system currently established the way it is right now. But also, Spencer, we know that Timmy B, he roots for chaos. He wants these <laughs> things to break a certain way so that he's got, uh, he's got some angles to cover. Timmy's always rooting for a, a little bit of unrest at the top of the BCS standings, correct? He's a sick man. I mean, that's, just, that's all I can say. I mean, he thrives on he thrives on chaos, and I think that the the more chaotic it gets, the better he's gets. All right, Spencer, we're going to get you out here on this. You know, Boise State, before we leave that, Boise State plays tonight against Fresno State uh, on the blue turf. Normally that would be a big game, but Fresno State on the year one and six. Spencer, let's get out on this. You mentioned earlier the November 18th game between Michigan and Ohio State. In the BCS era, is this the biggest regular season game since the BCS was created, one versus two, with all of the marbles on the line? Well, you know, I don't know. I think you got to go back last year. I mean, we don't have to go back too far in the BCS's history. Look at uh, we had the Ohio State and Texas. I mean, that, that was pretty darn good, too. Uh, I think this one will be big because it's the element of recency in play. It's the last 
time we've seen it, uh, and it's recent. So fresh in our minds, I'm anxious to see uh, this defense of Ohio State live up to the advanced billing that they've gotten before the season started. And then, you know what, having lost what they lost on defense, these guys have not missed a beat. Nope. They are a tremendously young, talented group. And then on the other side, defensively, I like what the Ron English has done with Michigan's defense. So I think whoever emerges from this game is going to be a legitimate team that also will probably be back in the mix for a national championship. I don't care who loses. Whoever loses, they're still going to be thick in the mix for a national title. Spencer, great stuff. We appreciate it. We'll be checking it out every Saturday on CBS. Great to talk to you again. See you on Saturday, Fair enough, Spencer. Guys. All we'll the talk best. To you later. Spencer Tillman, College Football Today on CBS, joining us here on CBS Sportsline. College football right now is the topic of conversation. We talked about it in our power performances and the performance of Oregon State knocking off USC, ending their dominance in the Pac 10. Their head coach, Mike Riley, nice enough to join us here on the program here on CBS Sportsline. Coach, it's Ian Eagle and Jason Horowitz. Congratulations. How you doing? Coach, are you there? Hello? Hey, Hi, coach, coach, how, how are, are you? you? Good, good. Well, congratulations hey, on the win, Coach. This was uh, obviously a big moment for you, big moment for your football team as well, with all the national attention how many of these interviews would you say you've done now over the last three days? Well, I've, uh, I've more than quadrupled my number for the year <laughs> last few days. So that's good stuff, though. I, I enjoy it because uh, it's a good sign for the program, and it, and it was a great win for our team. Coach, explain. Uh, a lot of people don't know much about Corvallis, Oregon. What was it like, the atmosphere, going into the game and then when everybody stormed the field? What was that like? Well, I had in the last... 10 years, uh, Corvallis has turned into a really good football town. I call it Happy Valley West. <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of excitement for the games, but always when uh, the Trojans come to town, there, it's, it, you know, it's, it's an added deal. You know, this is a very good football team, great program. I worked at SC at one time and have a lot of respect for the people there. So it's a big deal. And it was a great atmosphere, and we had a beautiful day in the Willamette Valley, so it all, it all turned out pretty well. Mike, from day one to now, what has impressed you the most about your team in terms of improvement, the things that you had in your head when this season started? Here we are now uh, after a huge win for your program. What has really stood out about the way your kids have performed? Well, the tangible things are we're playing better defensively by a long way, you know. Uh, you know, we're tackling better. We're, we're we're paying more attention to the detail of our jobs, and that's really was the first thing that started turning this team around. But the in, the intangibles are the character of the overcoming the adversity of the early year. That's what I really love about this team. I've enjoyed this team from way back in spring ball. You know, we weren't having success, but the kids kept going, and I think it was just, it's just turned into a great lesson for these guys. Mike, you, we were just talking with Spencer Tillman, and uh, one of the uh, callers was asking him about Boise State. You had firsthand experience earlier in this year at what Boise State could do. What are your thoughts about the Broncos and, and their shot to make it into a BCS Bowl now that there is a fifth BCS game? How about that? I mean, <laughs> it, it, it is... It makes me nervous talking about those guys. I hate going over there. They they have uh, beaten us badly in Boise. We've beaten them at home, but uh, it's a great program. Uh, and those guys are they are they've got good players. They're well coached, and on any given day, I think they can play with anybody. They played with Louisville uh, a few years ago in the bowl game, and they they did very well in the high scoring game, and and uh, they've beaten us. Oh, we're, we're split with them, I think, over the last four years. Mike, uh, you learn from all experiences during a coaching career, being an assistant, you yourself being a head coach in the NFL. What, what did you take out of that experience with the San Diego Chargers? Uh, obviously, I had a chance to talk to you a great deal during that time, and, and I think you always looked at it as this unique opportunity. Now that you look back on it, what did you learn from it, and how are you applying it to what you're doing today with Oregon State? Well, that, you know, I, I really feel fortunate in, in what I've gotten to do in my career, the different places, and, you know, the, you know whether it was professional or college. I've enjoyed it all. And I, I, what I think the uh, – I, I really liked 
the people that I had uh, to be around with it in the NFL, the uh, players, you know, Junior Sale, Rodney Harrison, John Perella, Jim Harbaugh, I could go on and on yeah. uh, about the character there and being around those guys and seeing why they were successful was a big deal. And then the football was, I think we bring in the football back, some of the stuff that we did and stuff that we learned about while we were in the NFL, I think it's been invaluable to the expansion of of what we do. So, I, l- I love that part of it. Coach, you're talking about characters. We'll get you out of here on this. Halloween last night, any of your football players come to practice dressed up as any of their favorite characters? What would you do for Halloween last night? <laughs> <laughs> I watch film. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's Spoken very like glamorous. A, very glamorous. Like I hate to ruin the, st- the story, but that was about it. But we did have a number of players on Sunday night uh, with other student-athletes at Oregon State put on a big Halloween party for kids in our indoor facility. So that was a lot of fun. My congratulations on the win. Good luck against Arizona State, the rest of the Pac-10 schedule. You've always been a class guy. We really appreciate you joining us here. Thank you for having me on. It, it's, it's certainly a, a pleasure to be with you guys. All right, it's Mike. Our pleasure. All the best. See ya. Head Talk coach at Oregon State, Mike Riley, joining us here on Power Performances presented by Courtyard by Marriott. So. You got your fill of college football between Spencer (laughs) Tillman and Mike Riley. Riley, one of the great stories of the weekend and that program on the rise again in Corvallis. Email questions. We want them. We've been asking for them all throughout the week. We compile them. We try to pick out the best. We're going to hit on them right now. Let's take a look at some of the uh, emails that you had on your mind. We're going to Alaska. Carrie joins us. Who is your favorite to win the BCS? I know it sounds like uh, it's kind of a broken record, but to me, Ohio State is still the best team. Defensively, there's some more question marks about this team than the one that won the national championship for Jim Trestle, but all in all, top to bottom, I still think they're the most complete team in college football. They are the most complete team in college football, but I I do think they may have a slip-up this year. Michigan has a chip on its shoulder because they have been basically handled by Ohio State uh, in three of the last four years. I personally think that it's West Virginia's time. Really? I think we are going to see West Virginia against the winner of Michigan, Ohio State. And I don't think anybody, you know, West Virginia and Ohio State have a similar offense, but West Virginia just pounds the football, and they have the athletes to do it. I think we're going to see West Virginia in the BCS championship game, and I think West Virginia is going to take it. And um, we'll see what happens. I mean, that, that could all go up in smoke tomorrow. All right, we're going to hit another email question. This one comes from Jared in Missouri. And... Jared writes, who is your pick to win the Super Bowl at this point in the season? I and you're covering the NFL. You've spanned the United States eight weeks now, heading into week nine. Who's your pick to win the Super Bowl? I like the Raiders. No. <laughs> no. They, they are a hot team right now, though. Give them some credit finally. Uh, I think Indianapolis. We've been building towards this. The Colts, last year they were the better team, but Pittsburgh found a way to win. This year I think Indianapolis figures it all out. Peyton Manning, very focused offensively. Without Edron James, I had some question marks. They're getting by with Joseph Adai. They're making it work. Defensively, that's always going to be the issue with the Indianapolis Colts, with all of that said. I do think they're the team that wants it the most, is the best prepared for that next step and the big stage that you face when you're fighting for a Super Bowl championship. Indianapolis is my pick. You know, I'm not sure who would win the Super Bowl right now, but what I would like to see is Indianapolis, Chicago. That offense, that defense, that would be one heck of a Super Bowl. All right, let's hit the phone calls. And if you're watching live right now, 646-CBS-1000, 646-227-1000, get your calls. And we're going to go to TJ in New York. And uh, TJ, uh, you know, one of the things people are talking about right now as far as Super Bowl hottest teams, the New York Giants, that's kind of where your question's going, right? It sure is. It sure is. And, uh, Jason, I don't care uh, what Ian says. Your hair looks great, man. <laughs> Appreciate yeah. that. It's a lot today. of product. The guy needs a haircut. Let's face it. <laughs> well, I, I wanted to know, you know, everybody's talking about Tiki, Tiki, and obviously he's one of my favorites as a Giant fan, but what do you guys think uh, Brandon Jacobs is going to do next year? you think he's going to be one of the leading rushers in the league? Uh, I think that's I probably jumping the gun a little bit. Jacobs has not been exposed to being an every down back so far in his career. That's not to say he's incapable of doing it. Uh, when you have Tiki Barber on your team, you kind of take for granted what he does to expect Brandon Jacobs to step in and be that kind of performer. He's not the pass catcher that Tiki is. Uh, he's a guy that, to me, still has an incomplete grade. He's fine in that short yardage role and. Uh, I think the Giants like him and feel like he can take on that role next year. They're not going to address it during the offseason if indeed Tiki retires, which we anticipate him doing. 
But to expect that Brandon Jacobs is going to be a 1,300, 1,400-yard rusher next year, that's jumping the gun a yeah, little bit. The problem with big backs in the NFL, uh, TJ, is that they take so much more of a pounding than smaller guys. And whether they can last through an entire season, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a whole other story. And whether he can become one of that, the, their leader for the entire season, they're going to have to go out and get another running back to help Brandon Jacobs as well. I, and we, we started a segment last week. It's called Just Off the Table. We, we discuss all kinds of things as far as what makes the show, what doesn't. Well, I guess by virtue of this being Just Off the Table, this makes the show. All right. I'm first up, and this came up in our production meeting. Tony Romo. Love the ribs. Love the quarterback. Tremendous performance on a nationally televised game. A lot of pressure on him. Stepping in. Everybody just assume while well, the Cowboys are bad. Drew Bledsoe replaced. What's Romo going to do? I think back. To Drew Bledsoe getting knocked out for the New England Patriots. Tom Brady stepping in, leading them to a Super Bowl. I'm not predicting that for the Cowboys, but for Romo, he handled the pressure quite nicely. Fine performance and a victory. Fine, you take Romo, I'll take Peyton Manning. You can have Romo all you want. Peyton Manning, you know, we talked about Reggie Wayne. Somebody had to get him the football. And Peyton Manning now 28 fourth quarter or overtime game-winning drives. That includes the one at Denver where Adam Vinatieri. How about Adam Vinatieri kicking all of those field goals against Indianapolis to win? Mm -hmm. Now he does it for Indianapolis. I'll take Peyton Manning all the time. All right, shift to the NBA. Opening night, the Miami Heat get their championship rings. And (laughs) that's where the night ended for the Miami Heat. Kirk Heinrich gets a new contract. He is financially stable. Him, his kids, his grandkids, his great, great, great grandchildren, everybody said in the Heinrich family after the Bulls rewarded him with a new contract. Then he rewarded them with a fine performance. The Bulls win in Miami, NBA opening night. Yeah, they looked good in uh, the Heat, the worst loss in NBA history by far for a defending champion opening night. All right, we're going back to college. Has this show been all about college football? It has. That's something good. We should get Timmy B on this show next time when we're talking college football. How about the Temple Owls? A 20-game losing streak, longest in Division I, coming to an end by beating Bowling Green at home. Heading into the game, Bowling Green, I believe, was 4-4. Temple wins, now the longest losing streak in college. The Duke Blue Devils, who haven't beaten a Division I opponent since Clemson in 2004. They had a win in 2005, but it was over, I believe, Furman. So Duke's got to get something going. And finally, back to the NFL. The cast of characters continue to change around Tom Brady, but one thing remains the same, his efficiency and his ability to win football games. Tom Brady with a masterful performance on Monday against the Minnesota Vikings. He was toying with the Vikings defense, and Brad Childress better watch out because I think there are going to be teams around the NFL now taking a peek at that film at the way Brady picked them apart. That's the way you attack the Minnesota defense. Brady, with such precision, he was was outstanding and... uh, Should we really be surprised? The fact that Tom Brady has not even been mentioned in our show, and here we are now getting ready for week nine in the NFL, that's the bigger upset. Yeah, and Bill Belichick is a master, absolutely, um, absolute master at scheming for teams. He knew Minnesota has a great rush defense, so simple plan. Just throw over it. Very simple. All right, folks, don't forget, we got a time for a few more calls. 646-CBS-1000, 646-227-1000. Call if you're watching live. Get in uh, on the horn and talk about our power performances, some of the college football we've talked about, NBA, whatever you want to talk about. It's now time to go to our top performance. And for me, it was it was pretty simple. We, we just spoke to head coach Mike Riley, and I think something we, we may have forgotten to mention, they stopped USC's 27-game Pac-10 winning streak. That dates all the way back to the first Pac-10 game of Carson Palmer's career, uh, uh, of uh, Matt Leinart's career in 2003, September 27th, 2003, at home against Cal, or, or maybe on the road against Cal, but it was definitely against Cal. 27-game Pac-10 winning streak. Oregon State, 33-10 lead, held on for the victory, and no, no bigger performance this week. My number one power performance this week It's got to be David Eckstein. The St. Louis Cardinals win the World Series. Eckstein right in the middle of it. The galvanizing force in games four and game five. Yeah, maybe I like the little guy. That's part of it. This is a guy that you could be standing behind online at Starbucks. You'd have no idea that that was the World Series MVP. And he is the number one power performance of the week here on CBS Sports Line. Yeah, everything that happened uh, that happened with St. Louis happened starting with David Eckstein. All right, it's time for our power predictions. And last week, Ian and I were 
Well, we were 0 for 2. Yeah. I went with Tatum Bell. You went with Brian Westbrook. We're going to get back on track this week. Why bring it up? Well, we'll just, we got to keep a record of this. <laughs> this week, I am going NBA. It's the first week of the season. And I'm going to go with the Ming Dynasty. 7'6", 310-pound Yao Ming. He's healthy. Tracy McGrady. The Rockets brought in Shane Battier. They're going to be better defensively. They have Bonzi Wells. They're going to be better offensively. And I think a lot of it's going to go through Yao Ming. He and Shaq, really the only two dominant centers left in the NBA. And I think he's going to get the Rockets off to a big start. They have four games, including tonight, before we have our next show next Wednesday. And I think they're going to be 4-0 when we come next Wednesday. And Yao Ming's going to be a big part of it. All right, my power prediction... College football, recurring theme on this show. West Virginia, Louisville, big matchup out of the Big East. And I expect the Mountaineer, Steve Slayton. I don't think either team can stop the other. I just happen to think that Steve Slayton will rack up enough yards to qualify as a power performer one week from now. West Virginia, Jason mentioned it earlier. I had no idea he was picking them to win a national championship. Just so happens it fits into my power prediction. Steve Slayton runs over the Cardinals, and West Virginia puts themselves in that position to be a dominant figure in the BCS. Well, if your power prediction is wrong, my national championship is wrong. So I win either way. And judging by your power predictions in the past, I'm done after tomorrow night. Good luck. (laughs) All right, we're going to go to the NBA and hit the phone calls a little bit longer. Phil in San Diego, he wants to talk about uh, the NBA as well. Phil, what do you think about uh, Yao Ming as a power performance for next week? Well, I would say I would make my own power performance and say he'll make it there before any Nick does this year. <laughs> uh, I think that's a fair point. Uh, it seems like today you guys are the Carnick, the Magicians. Predicting, I'd like to know, what are your predictions for the NBA, the championship this year? NBA uh, championship this you're year. You're calling the Nets games. Why don't, uh, why don't you start us off with this? Uh, you know what? I think Dallas is a motivated team, and although I don't look at their roster and say that there were massive improvements during the offseason, I expect Devin Harris to get better. I think now that Dirk Nowitzki has experienced an NBA championship series, he'll be better prepared for the next go-around. I know San Antonio seems to be most people's pick out of the Western Conference. Eastern Conference, I've heard Miami, I've heard Detroit, I've heard Cleveland. People are jumping on the LeBron James bandwagon. Chicago uh, getting a lot of support as well, certainly after their performance last night. I like Dallas. I think Dallas bounces back after uh, what should have been an NBA championship for them last year. They blew it against the Miami Heat. I still believe they were the better team. They just did not deliver when they were supposed to. Let's keep in mind, nothing in the NBA season will be decided after the first two weeks. So let's keep that in mind. But I'm not going to make an NBA championship prediction, but I'm going to make a couple of surprises. Wimp. Go ahead. Okay. The New Orleans Hornets. uh, Also the Oklahoma City Hornets, whatever they are. But the New Orleans Hornets this year... I think they are going to have a tremendous year. They brought in Peja Stojakovic. They brought in Bobby Jackson. They brought in Tyson Chandler. They're going to compete. They're in a tough division with those three teams in in, uh, Texas uh, as well as Memphis. But I think New Orleans is going to make a playoff run this year, and that's going to be my uh, my surprise prediction. Really went on a limb there. He's asking for a finals prediction, and you're giving me a team that's going to make the playoffs. Good stuff. <laughs> Folks, it's been a great show. Thanks for all the calls. Thanks for all the emails. We worked overtime here, Keep no? Keep coming. Yeah, you get paid extra Was for this that. discussed? <laughs> Don't forget, next Wednesday and every Wednesday at noon Eastern, live on CBS Sportsline. Keep the emails coming in throughout the week. To Mike Riley, we want to thank him very much and congratulate him very much, as well as Spencer Tillman. We'll see him on Saturday. We'll see you next week. Brian Eagle, I'm Jason Horwitz. Take care.